Dr. Charles and Stormy Mayo is a marine biologist whose first focus was on the ecology of oceanic fishes. Dr. Mayo was one of the three founders of the Center for Coastal Studies on Cape Cod. Since the center was founded, uh, was founded, Dr. Mayo has been studying endangered large whales. Recently, his work has focused on the relationship between the nearly extinct North Atlantic right whale and the ecosystem of Cape Cod Bay, to which the re whales return each winter. Dr. Mayo's work with right whales and with the center's whale rescue team have been the subject of a number of television shows and documentaries. In the early 1980s, Dr. Mayo recognized the rarity of the Stellwagen Bank ecosystem and proposed to the defenders of wildlife that the bank be considered for, na for sanctuary na um, nomination. Shortly thereafter, he, with the defenders of wildlife, formally offered arguments to NOAA that led to the nomination and, and eventual designation of the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had it all planned out, and then uh, something uh, came along that uh, struck me. And um, I'd like to, uh, to say that it distracted me enough over the last several days, mostly as friends uh, t called me from uh, places uh, in Spain and Portugal to talk about the situation uh, that we are confronted with uh, by the sinking of... Uh, of a vessel of all things called prestige. Uh, I think uh, it is one of those events that may seem far removed from Stellwagen, but uh, it occurred to me that it is uh, such a potential catastrophe and also an example that I couldn't avoid uh, mixing somewhere and somehow mixing in the, uh, the tragedy off of Spain, uh, the sinking of the prestige, um, with this talk. So I kind of reformulated everything, and I hope you'll bear with me uh, as, we, uh, as I try to get through this and give you some sense of how uh, that sinking really has a, a, a substantial long-term impact on this uh, relatively small piece of, of, of the ocean, uh, the, uh, the Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary. Uh, I also went back uh, some time to a recollection uh, that I, in fact, noted uh, in a notebook about uh, a little less than a decade ago, uh, in which uh, a manager, uh, not to be named, made uh, this rather extraordinary statement. And I'd like to help you understand why this plus the prestige come together to give a somewhat different vision uh, of, the, uh, of the sanctuary. Uh, in fact, for some of you, it may not seem like a rather extraordinary statement, but it does to me, and I'll hope to convince you of why it is. Uh, the issue of change in the ecosystem um, is important to consider when we look at Stellwagen and some of the really precious environments along the New England coast and, and worldwide. I, I guess it is that uh, when some of us were working with the whole idea of sanctuary in the early years uh, here on Stellwagen, um, we all kind of grasped the idea that sanctuaries in the ocean were somewhat like sanctuaries on land intended to be pretty much changeless. Uh, and certainly my grandfather who fished the middle ground, which was the name that I grew up with uh, knowing Stellwagen, it was called the middle ground between Gloucester and Provincetown, uh, and had been that for many generations of my family. Uh, when we looked at, uh, at, at Stellwagen, um, and my grandfather and before him, I think we always considered that uh, that change was not a significant part of the issue, that the system was always going to be productive, that it was open and limitless, and, uh, and that it would continue for good. Uh, some uh, later Mayos in my family came along and happened to hear about the sanctuary, and I think they wondered why, because we all have this sense that the ocean sort of spreads out forever, that things thrown into it dilute uh, infinitely, uh, that the prestige and its, uh, its unfortunate cargo at the bottom of the ocean uh, is too far away to have any influence. Uh, 
And in some ways, I suppose, this unnamed manager was capturing the same vision uh, that uh, there would not be change. And so I'd like to think about all of that and, uh, and try to look at it through the eyes of the animal that I know better than most uh, on the bank, uh, that is the northern right whale. Uh, what is it that the right whale, just a surrogate for a very complex a bunch of organisms that exist within the Stellwagen area and beyond, what is it that they confront with respect to change, uh, if you will, with respect to the changes that the prestige may work on them? Uh, the animal uh, that uh, I'll talk about is the northern right whale, and so perhaps I'll flip back to that uh, here and there along the way and give you some looks. I won't give you a lot of uh, the science of our work, although I, I probably won't be able to resist a bit of that. Um, the right whale uh, is, a, uh, is a remarkable creature. Um, some people in the audience know it better than I do by far. We, ha we are graced with a couple of the specialists uh, uh, from the New England Aquarium and elsewhere that, uh, that have come as though they're going to gain any knowledge from me today. Um, but it is a remarkable creature. Uh, very odd in uh, in its uh, in its body form, uh, and I would suggest to you that this is where we first run into the issue of change. This animal is so highly evolved that dramatic and rapid changes within its ecosystem, within Stellwagen and Cape Cod Bay, will likely trap it. Uh, it is not uh, capable of making a living on very much but the microscopic plankton that uh, that drives the whole ecosystem. But that's a surrogate, and let us face it, if the right whale can't make it uh, on plankton, then, then the clam won't and the crab won't. Uh, everything passes, uh, pretty much uh, develops its, 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 uh, its life through the plankton. So please remember the right whale is just an example. Uh, right whales are very different than the, uh, than the typical baleen whale that we know, the the fast-moving, fish-feeding fin whale. Uh, as I say, the structure of this creature is, is clearly evolved um, from, uh, from a very long and, and uh, intense period of adaptation. Uh, this is a photo by uh, Dave Wiley, who, uh, who captured a, a nice view of a calf in, uh, just south of, uh, of the Stellwagen Sanctuary. Uh, these photos are taken from either the sanctuary area or just south of it, uh, a lot of them from Cape Cod Bay. Wonderful symmetrical flukes, I would suggest. Uh, there's a very good reason, again, because of its adaptation to feeding, feeding on plankton, that it has such broad, uh, broad flukes. A very, a very powerful aspect ratio, sort of the tugboat of the, of the ocean world. Uh, another adaptation that I, again, will suggest change may trap. Um, if, uh, if the system changes considerably. Broad and beautiful tails uh, built for power. And odd heads, uh, the people at New England Aquarium, as you know, I'm sure, are doing uh, considerable work on the patterns of the, of the callosities on the heads of these whales. And those patterns are individually distinctive, allowing uh, much as the study of tigers or, or, uh, or gorillas um, virtually all large terrestrial mammals looking at uh, individual patterns as natural markings. So those patterns are important in research. Uh, it's not clear why they carry these, uh, these structures on their heads. It is clear they're infested by a, a yellowish uh, organism, uh, sometimes mustard colored, that allows us to see the roughened skin patches. When those skin patches are cleaned uh, uh, of the uh, small crustaceans, you can see they're not nearly as visible uh, cornified tissue that uh, is really important to those of us who study right whales. Uh, you can see here, for instance, in this mother that came over to the boat, the, uh, the um, roughened surface of the thousands of organisms uh, clinging to the heads of right whales to those roughened patches. Uh, this is fake data. Uh, I'm told you're allowed to fake the data when you don't have anything better. You just are obligated, if you're a scientist, to say this is fake. So this is fake, but it's really meant to indicate that uh, the right whales have proceeded in some sort of rather precipitous decline, likely not as smooth as this, but uh, sometime 
uh, in the early part of, uh, of settlement here in North America, the northern right whale decline, began its decline. We don't know where it started. We have uh, a small question mark as to where it has arrived. Uh, but basically, that it probably dropped from the tens of thousands uh, at some point in its past to now the low hundreds. So part of the story is that this animal, uh, unlike the clam, or maybe unlike the clam, but perhaps closer to the cod that lives on Stellwagen, this animal is in uh, considerable trouble. I've indicated in sort of a pinkish color uh, the latter part of its history, uh, the recent part of its history, when uh, whaling had, uh, had stopped. And one of the curios, and I think it relates very directly to this question of change and the impact of, of uh, ocean-wide uh, pollution, among other things, on the animals, is the fact that the right whale, though fully protected, uh, does not uh, demonstrate a dramatic rebound. My understanding from people who work in the Pacific is that uh, this is in contrast to another whale that showed an early history uh, of numbers much like this, uh, that is the gray whale of the, of the uh, North Pacific, which showed a substantial decline from perhaps tens of thousands uh, to uh, in the early part to mid part of uh, this past century, uh, a decline in the low hundreds. The gray whale, as you may know, has rebounded. Now, admittedly, uh, the gray whale lives a different life, but maybe therein is an indication of why uh, this population has not rebounded, uh, being a plankton feeder, and the gray whales have, uh, have come back in extraordinary numbers as soon as they were offered, uh, offered the kind of, uh, of protection that was needed. So you can imagine that... Uh, this uh, curve that drops down, in the case of the gray whale, about where it becomes pink, it begins to rise sharply. But as you can see, approximately in the case of right whales, uh, that has not occurred. Why is it that this animal, now protected from its original cause of decline, as best we can tell, uh, now remains at such low numbers? And I think that's a problem for all of us but it relates to ecosystems uh, like Stellwagen, one of the last places where right whales are found. So it's gone really from uh, the uh, coast of North Africa where uh, once it was common, uh, down here somewhere, if I can move this, uh, along this coast, uh, right whales once, once uh, were found uh, giving birth to calves, uh, an analog perhaps to the uh, Florida and Georgia calving grounds now being studied by the people here at the aquarium. Uh, it's no longer found in the Bay of Biscay, uh, where once, uh, in fact, originally in the 1100s, uh, the, uh, the whales were hunted. Uh, in fact, it's right about here where the prestige is sunk. Uh, but the right whales are no longer there, but as rare strays, nor up through most of the uh, distribution, the old distribution. It is principally here in the Gulf of Maine uh, that uh, right whales are still found. And Stellwagen is one of the uh, locations where we do see them. Cape Cod Bay, uh, perhaps an even stronger location in our region, uh, north to the Bay of Fundy uh, and to uh, the Roseway Basin south of Nova Scotia. So the right whales have declined in numbers and their range has decreased dramatically. Quick look at the uh, direct threats to the animals, meaning the things that kill them keeping in mind that there are plenty of direct threats uh, within the Stellwagen system that equally affect uh, the bird life and the fish life, similar problems uh, that one could, uh, could use in that analogy. Uh, they were killed in great numbers, as I've said, and that's, of course, the apparent reason for the original decline. But in the present, what are the things that may be causing uh, the, uh, the failure of right whales to return in numbers? Uh, some of them, in terms of direct threats, are, are quite obvious, obvious to those of us who work with them. They include uh, entanglement and fishing gear. Uh, these uh, two right whales are lucky in this case. They made it by, and they seem to really escape this more often than not, quite often, although there are strong indications uh, that uh, many right whales, perhaps probably the majority of them, are at some point in their lives entangled in fishing gear. The results are such things as this. Uh, this is a whale that you may have read about um, 2030. 
that eventually, and we'll see a picture in just a moment, was was uh, uh, cut pretty much through its uh, its its outer surface, and I'm told maybe into the visceral area uh, by uh, one of the lines. Uh, this one, I believe, Scott. Do you know which one it was? Is it the Ford one? Yeah, maybe the Ford one here. One of them um, cut through the animal, uh, uh, was under tremendous strain, and eventually took the life of this animal. Uh, this uh, is, I think, Scott, this is a female, right? Is that, that was a female, I think, yeah. A reproductively mature female. An immense loss uh, to, the, to the hope for the future of this population. Uh, here she is down here, actually. You can see uh, the, the tissue is pulled away, but that's that individual. Uh, we worked uh, with uh, Krauss's group, the New England Aquarium group, for much of a September a few years ago, trying to free this whale from its entanglement. We got most of the lines cut, but uh, there was no hope for the last one, and that finally uh, ended in her death. Uh, but you can see other examples uh, most of the stories are not particularly good for reasons I can't go into now. Uh, our successes with freeing right whales are not, are not good. Uh, of course, right whales are uh, premier animals, and so we pay a great deal of attention to them. Uh, marine mammals have all the protections that we, we, we certainly appreciate, and we uh, do what we can to save them. Uh, less so, um, certainly, marine birds, uh, and fish is caught um, uh, really as bycatch. So there's an awful lot of destruction going on for which, in the case of this surrogate, um, uh, we're seeing uh, entanglement. But you can imagine that the ecosystem uh, where uh, Stellwagen is is substantially influenced by things like ghost gear and, and whatever. Uh, this just happens to be dramatic and draw our attention. And, of course, the right whales are so rare it, it makes an important story. Each one of these animals I, I'm resisting telling you about because I've spent a lot of time with, with all of them, uh, with only one in these three, uh, four examples, and with only one, the upper left, uh, is there any suggestion of success? We have had a little more success than, I, than I've portrayed here, but, but not as much as we'd like. Uh, the take-home, by the way, that I have to say at every talk is one that uh, should any of you uh, want to rail against, uh, against some of these issues, uh, those of us who do the work uh, here seen uh, working on a whale uh, 2212 that we did, we successfully got it out of gear. We're not sure it lived, but um, since we do the work, I can say with some degree of honesty that the solution to this problem is not us going out there doing this. The solution is finding some method to allow the fishermen to fish and the whales to share the habitat, and we don't have that yet. Techniques of fishing that will allow it. We'll get a few whales out, but not enough. And uh, if you read about our successes, uh, then uh, cheer us on, but don't think that that's the answer to the problem. Uh, lots of pictures of us having trouble. Another area of of uh, concern, and Stellwagen is crossed, crisscrossed by, by ships, um, is this. Uh, there's a whale, a right whale under the bow of that vessel, actually a little bit displaced beyond it, but nonetheless, uh, vessel strikes have been shown to be exceedingly important to right whales, and we have had at least one, maybe two whales that, that might very well have been struck and killed within the Stellwagen bank system. We don't know where we found the carcasses, and at least it's an argument. So vessel strike is, uh, is a consideration. Uh, and uh, deaths like this, this a, a reproductively mature female uh, on a beach that uh, I towed it to um, in, in Wellfleet, uh, this uh, big female was reproductively mature and struck by a ship uh, and had a lot of internal damage. Uh, including uh, broken, broken vertebral processes and a broken jaw and eventually died. It is sad enough to see it happen. It's all the more sad when it's with an animal nearly extinct and how much more of a sadness since she was the future of right whales. Uh, she would have given birth, we hope, to a number of, uh, of calves and I think had already done so in a couple of cases. A sad end uh, to, uh, to a 
uh, a pretty extraordinary creature. A couple of more views of gory views. The bottom one is of a of a calf of the year uh, a year ago. Uh, not much hope there. Well, I so far have depressed you, and uh, I'll keep trying to do my best to depress you more. Um, there are indirect threats, and they are not as um, as dramatic as the ones we've seen. And I want to point that out to you because these indirect threats relate directly to the the issue of of change within the system, as the last ones did. I mean, did whales uh, traveling within the, the uh, Massachusetts Bay ecosystem uh, up until really the last several centuries uh, cope with uh, great quantities of plastic rope that would never rot on their bottoms? That's a big change. Did they deal with ships traveling at 20 knots with propellers, as in the case of some of the ones we've seen here from their marks, propellers maybe 10 feet across? Uh, did they did they deal with that? No. They are dealing, as we have to deal, with an ecosystem changed. Just as the bottom fauna of, of uh, Massachusetts Bay deals with a with nets that are ever more efficient, uh, made of of uh, materials and and ever larger uh, that uh, take the bottom uh, surface of the of the system and turn it over and destroy as many. Uh, as many worms, perhaps, in a single pass as uh, all the whales in the world that are killed. So it's, it's an issue across the board within our ecosystem. Change has come to this system, and we can't deny it. It's not the place that uh, our ancestors once knew, and it is not, in that strict sense, a sanctuary that can be prevented from change. And I suppose that's a hard thing to say, as one who fought for the sanctuary, but it's true. We have to find a way of working with these. Well, what are the indirect threats? And they are they come to us in many forms. Uh, what is the future of this, of this system? And how may they be managed? I'm not going to talk about the management. Uh, the uh, director of the sanctuary is here. He perhaps could illuminate that, but I will tell you, from my perspective, what it is the whale see. Uh, I could not resist another look at the prestige before she sunk, um, and I cannot tell you how wrong it is to think, um, just on the surface of it, that if she goes to the bottom and the oil becomes very thick, that we will not ever have to worry about it in the Atlantic system. It will be there. It will just be there in a perhaps more insidious form. And it will be on Stellwagen, because this oil from the Prestige will eventually be here. The ocean is not limitless, and the National Marine Sanctuary that we here talk about does not have the hard boundaries that the, that the pencil lines on maps suggest. Unfortunately, but realistically, we have to recognize that the ocean around is a big part of the success of uh, this ecosystem. So in a sense, Stellwagen is partly the Androscoggin River. It's certainly the Bay of Biscay. If you look at it on different scales, the scale that right whales perhaps have, uh, then you are seeing a very different ocean and the issues for the sanctuary are the issues for the ocean as a whole. Well, I c again, I can't resist the pictures recently from, uh, from over in Spain um, because I, I again suggest to you the limited nature of the ocean and its reaction to these changes will be here, perhaps not tomorrow, but they'll be influencing the whales and the fauna of our system. Uh, the ocean receives an awful lot. After all, it's liquid, and that makes it real different from, from the sanctuaries of the land that can be better walled off. The stuff that goes into the ocean goes everywhere, and if it's conservative, again, it will be here. 
Um, an example I couldn't resist as soon as I knew Mike Mickelson from the MWRA would be here. I could not resist, and he, he is smiling at this thought. My God, he's going to bring in the Boston outfall. Uh, the outfall uh, came to us, and I've, I'll have to tell this story for his sake. Uh, we can imagine that the engineers of, um, of the past, I'm not sure when, uh, looked about Boston and said it's a hell of a mess. We've got to do something with this sewage. And so the engineers uh, suggested, I think, a brilliant idea. They thought a brilliant idea. Why not put it into Boston Harbor? Uh, because the tides will come and go, and the harbor will self-clean, and it will be flushed out into the ocean that is limitless and never return. And as we well know, Boston Harbor became, in fact, the center of a major political battle when uh, Governor Dukakis was running for election because it turned out, as I understand, Boston was one of the most polluted of all harbors, and it was a hard thing for the governor to wriggle out of. Uh, that, uh, I imagine, had a lot to do with the development of a new plan. Well, in the old days, the, the fishermen argued that Boston Harbor was too pure to, to put sewage into, but eventually the engineers won the day. They built the most advanced sewage system, and we know what happened. Uh, it wasn't quite advanced enough, and the tides didn't flush quite enough, and the result was a pretty foul mess, and some of you here likely know it better than I do. It needed solution. So the engineers of, of this later time said, well, the answer is to put a pipe outside the harbor, and the tides will come and go, and uh, the uh, pollution will be dispersed into a limitless sea, and the fishermen, the sons of fishermen, said, we'd rather not have it, but we do now have it. And indeed, we have the most advanced system of treatment. Thanks to Mike, I was invited to the first disposal. Uh, and I'm not ready to do what people argue I always do, and that is to hammer the, the MWRA. Um, but I am going to say that, that we have to understand this whole system is interlocked. And the effort that MWRA is going through and we are independently is to try to understand what changes, if any, we can detect within the system. How will the outfall uh, just outside Boston interact with the tides coming down or the currents coming down into Cape Cod Bay and over the Stellwagen system? And what will that uh, bring to those systems? The only difference between me and most uh, is that I insist that there is a great area of uncertainty that the first engineers did not appreciate. Perhaps the engineers of today do, but I guess I will last complete that story that I've gotten tangled up in and ask if it happens that this system doesn't work and we at some point in the future complain that Massachusetts Bay and Cape Cod Bay are not as they once were. I say if, because it looks like we have a good system working, to be honest. But if that were to occur, would engineers, the grandsons of engineers, argue that we should go further over Stellwagen, out beyond the reaches of the interior currents, where the tides could come and go and sweep the ocean system clean into a limitless sea? I guess there has to be an end, and I just don't know if this this new project, which certainly has done an amazing job of cleaning the inner areas, is doing uh, the job uh, for the outer areas. Everything points to it, and so I think the bill of health is looking clean, but we're continuing to look at it, and uh, Mike is looking at it, and my hope is we'll have some answers. These are all issues of change within a system, though. And I guess I now need to revisit uh, since I've gotten myself into this corner, that line from the, the management agency that we saw earlier, that there would be no change. And it is manifest that you cannot make that statement honestly. You can't add materials to the system and make no change. 
It's an issue of degree. Will Stellwagen change because of the outfall? Unquestionably, it will. Will it change significantly? That is, will right whales not be able to feed there? Will clams not be able to make their go? Will fishermen not be able to fish? I'm inclined to say from what I see that that is not the case. We should not say there will not be change. We're not capable of that. The, the system will change with everything we do. And being aqueous, it will change because of the prestige. It will change because of the Androscoggin. It will change because of me on Cape Cod flushing my toilet. The issue is how much change is there. And for people who work in Stellwagen, the ultimate um, residency of that question is in a difficult area. That is, how much change can it be detected? Right now, there's almost no detection of the Boston outfall, except that it's cleaner on the inside. Are right whales influenced? You'll never get me to say that right whales are influenced by the outfall, not with our present data. But has there been change? Without question, there has been change. Uh, I'd just like to point out that all of this, our attempt to understand these, these things that have influenced uh, the inner system of, of Massachusetts Bay and the right whales that, that have watched it for millennia, has also had to deal with, with issues far beyond any of those kind of provincial ones that I've given you. It deals with the global changes, and those are ones I personally have no feeling for but what I see on the news. But certainly there is an indication we have global warming. It still is an argument as to how much humans contribute. In some circles, you'll hear one. In some circles, you'll hear the other. We'd like to think we can control these things. But, but is there a difference? And will that r really wreak uh, immense change within the biota and the ecosystem of the bank? It's another question that lies unanswered, just vague ideas about it. My sense is that we will see very different places within the, the Stellwagen system if sea, sea surface, uh, sea level rises continue and, and sea temperatures increase. But I do think that, uh, and I hope you can appreciate, that all of these changes have their influences, but it is unclear uh, what the causes are, and it's unclear what the degree of the reaction of the system will be. Uh, that one uh, gives you, this gives you just a little bit of a look at El Nino, just to say there's a clear relationship between El Nino events and, the, uh, and, and events within the biological system. So undoubtedly, El Nino is influencing it. Have we gone through enough bits and pieces? I suppose so. There are many things going on in this system, and they are far beyond uh, the easy reaches of management within a box drawn out here, yet all the system reacts. Um, I wanted to go through the right whale bits and pieces just to tell you that, that those changes that I've suggested without really giving you very much concrete because we don't know all of the all of the pieces that, uh, that fit together here, nonetheless have an influence on the critical activities of this nearly extinct species. This, uh, I don't know, this may be from the Bay of Fundy, uh, but uh, we have had views, particularly up on Stellwagen, of dense aggregations of, uh, of socializing, in fact, mating uh, right whales. And uh, you can imagine it's pretty remarkable for us when we see uh, such things because... Uh, we're looking at, um, at an animal nearly extinct performing the most critical behavior we could imagine. Uh, the results of those are uh, young calves uh, and the influence of, uh, of variations within the ecosystem uh, remain uh, pretty much obscure. Uh, we have one area that, we, uh, that I personally can relate to and that has to do with calving rates and I'll touch that in a moment. Uh, these data from the New England Aqu Aquarium show something of the radical variations within uh, the, uh, the reproductive rate of right whales uh, up until the year 2000. And you can see by the year 2000, there was a severe drop in the calving rate. I'm happy to say that work in the southeast demonstrates that there was a, 
a real pulse that came in in, in 2001, yet it appears on average that the right whales of the North Atlantic are reproducing at a really an, a frighteningly low rate when you average it all out. And the question uh, that has come to us is, uh, could there be some environmental um, causes to that? Um, another critical behavior, one that we spend a lot of time on, is feeding activity. There's a mouth gaped open, you can see on the left, in the rows of baleen. Uh, here a whale li head lifted out just off, uh, just in the southern end of uh, Stellwagen Bank. Um, this animal uh, feeding on plankton. And uh, diagrammatically, uh, what you're looking at is a whale uh, pushing a huge plankton net through the water, the large tail having an obvious purpose. Uh, that tail is needed. You need to be a tugboat to push a giant bucket through the water. If you've hung a bucket over the side of a moving boat, you know how much pressure you develop. To make a living, the right whale has to do that. So uh, one of the many adaptations that the whale has is to that, uh, that way of life. Uh, we're interested in the connection. In fact, I've been dwelling on the connection between uh, right whales and the rest of the system. And to do that, we look at plankton. Uh, now thousands, many thousands of, of records of what it is that right whales eat to understand a little bit more of how global change, pollution, and the like may be influencing uh, these animals. Uh, it's a long and difficult study, and it's more marine biology than it is whale biology. Uh, we do know much now about what it is that makes them live. We know that right whales find a rich resource in, in the Cape Cod area uh, uh, and also north uh, as far as Gloucester, uh, rich patches of, uh, of microscopic plankton organisms. And they undertake a feeding strategy that uh, I've spoken probably to several of you about before. Um, but I think there's a wonderful symmetry here um, in, in what we find and what, what it tells about the way they strategize. Whales in the magenta, this whale uh, swims in a very, very complicated uh, swimming pattern. Uh, it's known as area-restricted area searching. It's zigzagging uh, through uh, the system. And in yellow, that same whale later, with its mouth closed, swims in a straight line. And I've often uh, suggested that you consider, if you were going out for blueberries or mushrooms or something in a wild area, when you found a patch, when you found one, uh, plant or mushroom, you'd probably start zigzagging if we plotted your track. Uh, you'd be wise to begin to walk around in circles because you may be in an area that's good. And the same thing is true of right whales. They find plankton in patches. And when you're in a patch, you make sure you hang around. Uh, if you're in an area where there are a lot of fast food restaurants uh, later in the evening, I suggest if you want a fast food restaurant, you find one, you'll find more. So don't keep on going straight zigzag and you'll find other ones. But when you are not finding your resource, you go in straight lines, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, an interesting parallel is the, is the pattern of the lowly fly. So tomorrow morning, as you uh, try to keep that fly out of your cereal, uh, you'll notice in this uh, research effort, this is kind of uh, one of those, who was the, was it, was it Birch Bay? Someone used to give out the Golden Fleece Award for the craziest um, use of federal funds. This is one of those, uh, probably one of those candidates. Uh, a researcher put out um, little clumps of uh, sugar in a, in a square form, uh, the, the, the white dots, and you can see that the fly that he was studying uh, zigzagged over the areas where the patch was dense. And right whales do just about exactly as the fly does or as you will do if you go, uh, go out and look for, uh, for blueberries. Uh, zigzag and straight line is the approach that all animals take to patchy environments. Here's a, uh, a patch up here that the fly missed. And of course that happens within the system. The question for me is how do variations within the Cape Cod Bay, Stellwagen Bank area with respect, in this case, to right whales uh, change as patch characteristics change? And how does that compromise the energy intake for right whales? Uh, the results of those area-restricted searching patterns are, uh, are clump distributions that likely ref reflect whales finding the areas of high patch density uh, and avoiding, because they are swimming in straight lines with their mouths closed, those areas 
where food is not good. Uh, and uh, just to follow that uh, a bit more, uh, here we look at that same pattern of, uh, of calving. Uh, we erected a hypothesis. I hope this shows you how there may be some indications of the intersect between the quality of the Cape Cod uh, system and the southern Gulf of Maine uh, and how changes in that environment may substantially affect the future of right whales or of anything else within the system that uses, uh, uses plankton as a food, and that's nearly everything at one stage or other in their lives. The hypothesis uh, that we had in this study was that the success of right whales in the western North Atlantic reflect, reflects the quality of the Cape Cod food uh, resource. And the result, uh, when we lagged uh, measures of food against calving, lo and behold, was a very high degree of relationship between the density of patches within, within the Cape Cod region, uh, as far north as the central part of Stellwagen, uh, and uh, the, uh, the reproductive rate of, uh, of the North Atlantic population. Uh, very low P level means uh, there is a high degree of relationship between the two, suggesting that food may have a substantial impact on the calving rates uh, of the population. There is much more, of course, to say about this, but again, you can understand that these variations that you see in the blue line, which is the Cape Cod Bay food measure, those variations are likely not by chance. They're changes in the density related to the quality of the environment and its oceanography, perhaps to El Nino, perhaps to pollutants and the like. And the reflection on calving rates, so critical to right whales, is pretty clear. So uh, we ask the question, and I suppose the answer still is not clear, uh, but we do know that there are substantial influences. This is a complex system. It's a system, though, that I'm going to argue communicates across beyond the margins of Stellwagen. So there are local issues that the management of Stellwagen will deal with, but ultimately uh, the whole system all of its biota will be, uh, as we saw with its surrogates, influenced by the larger ocean, by its characteristics, by its support. So what about change that I raised in the beginning? Uh, what can we say of change that my grandfather thought didn't occur in the oceans? It seemed at his scale of view, but maybe not at the scale of the right whale, uh, to be a changeless environment. Uh, what about the ocean boundaries? I've already implied that. Uh, is it a bounded ocean or not? Is it as he thought? And, and, and as all of us may think as we stand at the edge of the ocean, that it is boundless, limitless, and that it will disperse uh, whatever impacts forever. Uh, on change, I would suggest to you it is inevitable whether it is human-caused, obviously, or, or whether it is caused by things well beyond us, by solar flares and whatever. But I'm going to tell you that it is relative. In the short term, there is very little change apparent. However, change is occurring in the system, impacting Stellwagen, impacting the managers of Stellwagen, those of us who use it, at, I think, an ever-increasing pace. There is now whale watching on Stellwagen there was not before. There is now plastic rope on Stellwagen there was not. And all of that is coming on a pace. And lastly, are there ocean boundaries? It's an aqueous system. There are no boundaries. In both cases, uh, both on the issue of change and on boundaries, it's all really more an issue of scale. Uh, if you s deal with this ocean as a, as a boxed-in system then, and you look at it only over matters of minutes or hours, then it seems changeless and it seems bounded. But in the long term, for the good of right whales, for the good of the resources of the, of the system, uh, good managers and those of us who care about the system have got to recognize that uh, it does not get bounded that we will be visited by the prestige uh, at some point to perhaps a minimal degree. And I think if we can understand that, we may do a better job. Um, 
And I think I'd ought to stop there because I think I've used my time, but my hope is that you can grasp more questions than answers. And I, my hope is that you can see that the right whale's experience indeed is, um, is one that is the experience of the ocean system and that Stellwagen's future uh, is the right whale's future, is the lobster's future, is the fisherman's future. It's one of those lovely parts of this system uh, that we are all tied really immeasurably tightly together. And to forget that uh, is to probably miss the point of sanctuary, of ocean, and of experience. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the question is, why not ban plastic rope? And, and of course, um, in that ocean that my grandfather knew, uh, the rope was, he fished with it. It was a, one hell of a deal for him. He spent a lot of time uh, tarring ropes to try to keep them from rotting. Uh, and my, my early life saw plenty of that in, a, in, our, in our kitchen. Uh, the answer is they don't want to go back to the kitchen. Uh, and, and modern techniques really are required to harvest an ocean that is no longer as productive as it once was. Uh, we're not going to see a return to the old biodegradable ropes, uh, largely because neither the industry nor the consumer will tolerate it. Uh, that's my judgment. Now, there may be some variations uh, that can be worked out, and some people come up with some wizard ideas that make the ropes uh, non-biodegradable until some imaginary time when at four months or five months they, they begin to fall apart, and maybe we'll see that, but it's pretty tough life being a fisherman. I mean, as I've often said, it's the, not only the right whales are endangered, but so are the fishermen of New England, and they will go extinct given the amount of resource if they're not able to fish with the kind of gear that, uh, that now is required to catch the fish that we all eat. I mean, we're all participators, and uh, we need it. So unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see that unless there's some modern, some new modern techniques. Uh, I didn't ask the question, did I? Did I, I didn't restate the question. The question was, why not... Um, why not uh, biodegradable ropes, the old kinds of ropes, instead of the, uh, the plastic ones they use now? I, I guess I should add, the reason that the old biodegradables were good is that right whales sw or other whales or other organisms swim around for sometimes for months uh, declining in condition. In that time, the old lines would rot off them. Uh, the modern ones don't. Uh, any other? Yeah, Mason. Yeah, uh, the, the question is quite obviously the center of my argument, and that is basically, so what do you do uh, when you're dealing with so many jurisdictions? And in fact, in most cases with uh, events, some of the ones I've described, events that are, uh, are really in unregulated parts of the world, in the open oceans. And um, far be it for me to come up with good, clean answers on that one. Uh, I think there are a lot of people working on those. Uh, one issue is that the prestige uh, was single-hulled. And there is a, uh, there is, I don't know, incidentally, that if it had been double-hulled, from what I hear, it would have saved us the tragedy, but it might have. 
but there are regulations. They have been hard won, but there are regulations that are international through the IMO and the like that have, in that case, uh, required new boats to have double hulls uh, so that if they're punctured, they don't, uh, they don't spew it all out. I think it's a terrible problem. I mean, I'm s looking at the manager of Stellwagen Bank and making an argument that a consideration is that you've got to worry about the prestige. There's enough. Every time I use the word prestige, considering it that what that boat went through, I'm I'm amused. But, but, um, but you know, we can, It's the problem of, of 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 international law, which has in the oceans turned out to be a terrible mess. And I don't know what the answer is. I can I can barely get around as I tried to tonight to tell you that there seems to me a larger palette when we consider something like. Uh, the, the really critical areas of Stellwagen Bank. Uh, it's one monstrous problem, and we can't seem to solve almost any of them on an international basis. We can see that with the international politics of today. So I'm, I'm lost on that one. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the correlation so far, amazingly, has held. Uh, there was a tremendous burst of calves. Uh, oh, the uh, sorry, the question. The question was, uh, does the correlation between food and calving rates hold up uh, in, the, in the last couple of years that were not shown in the graph? And the answer is it re the correlation remains very high. Uh, I'm sort of surprised at that, but the methods used statistically uh, – in some sense compensate for the extremity of the of the fluctuation. So there appears uh, a, a statistical indication that there is still a very high relationship between uh, food quality and Cape Cod Bay. Let, let me say, and, and, and I, in that case a lot of the data are from Cape Cod Bay, but it, it applies apparently also to Stellwagen Bank. And I think there's other, another question, which is why Cape Cod Bay Stellwagen Bank in the southern Gulf of Maine. And I think the answer is that, that what we get is an indicator of the quality of the Gulf of Maine as a whole. And so we're not really saying that, that, that Massachusetts, Cape Cod Bay, Stellwagen are, are, um, are, are critical to the future of right whale calving, but that they indicate the criticality of the, of the food resource and hence, any variation within that food resource uh, within the Gulf of Maine will be reflected in our area of collection. That's the way. That's the way I interpret it. Otherwise, it makes very little sense to me that this little tiny patch around Cape Cod could control calving uh, through the North Atlantic. The uh, question is, what are the critical factors uh, to the concentration of, of uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton? Um, in my view, the most critical uh, question, phytoplankton is, is important only because it's fed on by the animal plankton that the right whales eat, those little shrimp-like creatures we saw. Uh, but my, my view is that... Um, indeed, that the phytoplankton is ultimately important, and the relationship is among marine biologists is not always crystal clear, so we're still learning. Uh, it's that imperfection that worries me when we make absolute statements about our management of the oceans, because we don't know a lot of these things. But, uh, but as far as right whales are concerned, uh, probably through, uh, through all the time they've lived in Cape Cod waters, perhaps all six millennia probably be, since the glaciers were here, uh, they likely would tell you that the most critical thing for them is, uh, is the density of the individual patch. Not how much food there is in, in the region, but how dense that patch is. They'll find it, small though it may be. If it's good and rich, it'll work. What is the story on how dense the patches are? How do you form a patch? Um, most of us haven't even, I mean, probably very few of you have even seen a patch of plankton uh, or know that you've seen one. Uh, so it's a pretty hard concept, but I can assure you it's there. There are rich little pockets, very ephemeral. And uh, 
we're still just understanding that. It has to do with physical oceanography, the, the presence of good uh, general quantity of plankton, uh, and uh, has to do with a lot of uh, the, the issues that we're confronting, like uh, El Nino uh, influencing wind patterns that uh, change the way the patches form. It's a very complicated story, uh, and not one that I think many of us have yet grasped. Yeah. Would you mind if I deferred, and I'll repeat the answer, as the question is, what's the age of right whales? And I'm going to have to defer, since we have the specialist in the, in the audience, and I'll repeat it. Krauss, Scott Krauss has got to tell me what, the, what he thinks the age is of right whales. And I'll... Age, weight, and typical travel distance, and I'll, I'll talk it through here. You've got you to give us uh, the answer, because I could tell you what I've heard Scott Krauss say, but... I'd rather have him tell you. 80 years plus or minus 20. 80 years plus or minus 20. And uh, 50 size? 50 tons plus or minus 20. 50 <laughs> tons plus or minus 20. Let's see if we'll come up with a plus or minus 20 now. <laughs> rate, rate of speed? Swimming? Speed? Yeah, I find that interesting too. Swimming? I was just thinking like distance that they may travel. Uh, 100 miles a day plus or minus 20. <laughs> and Scott says 100 miles a day, plus or minus 20. What about speed? Uh, maximum 8 knots, average 5. Maximum Max, eight. Average 3. I would say 3, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's getting more my territory. I'd say at, at speed of these animals in their habitat. Now, in migration, it's a little different game, but in the habitats that they arrive in, probably 3 to 4 knots is their sort of average speed. When they're feeding, it's 1.2 to 2.4 is what we calculated uh, knots. And and when they're traveling, maybe 5 and maximum speeds, uh, maybe 8 uh, or 9 is, uh, is what we're hearing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the question is, is there something particular about the habitats that I was telling you that many of them have been uh, really have, have, have lost the animals, but uh, the question for many of us, particularly for managers, is why places like the southern Gulf of Maine or the Bay of Fundy or east of Nantucket in the Great South Channel, why are those places important? Um, and, and I think the model we go on... Um, in the case of the high latitude areas, uh, whether in the southern hemisphere where there's a, a, another apparently different species or maybe different species of, of right whale, uh, or the northern, is that the high latitudes generally are uh, inhabited, they end up as being the hot spots because of the hot spots for food. Uh, this animal is very much kind of an ungulate model in that it's finding patches of good grass I think of it that way. Uh, it has a bigger problem than any goat ever had because the grass keeps moving around and you can't depend on it very well, and it's in three dimensions. Uh, but it is kind of going up and down a hillside, finding, as you knew last year, there would be pockets of good forage. And then in those areas of good forage, uh, you particularly reproduce. Uh, but it looks like that's in high latitude. In low latitudes, it appears that there are um, conditions, particularly relative to, to sea surface temperature, that make it favorable for birthing. Uh, among other things, at least one of the thoughts, it doesn't appear that they feed in these low latitude areas. On this coast now, the area of, of uh, calving uh, is off Florida and Georgia, and it appears to have certain uh, conditions within the surface, uh, the upper above thermocline temperatures uh, that, uh, that make it good for calving. And the theory, though, you'd have to ask mothers of right whales to know whether it's really the case, but it looks like it's a good idea if you've got a calf with a thin layer of blubber, among other things, to work in a certain temperature environment. Uh, Cape Cod Bay is running about in, in Celsius about 
uh, one, uh, 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius in the winter time. At that same time, the mothers who uh, were pregnant in Cape Cod Bay are down in the south in water temperatures around 10. And that difference may be an important one. There seems then an energetic reason. Have your calf in warmer waters. Not too warm, but warm enough so that you can, you really can make an energy gain. Is there any? Yes. Um, it's like about all the other answers. You can't really be sure. Uh, I've tended to be more conservative on that issue, uh, though I've had a lot of association with the whale watching industry. I've thought that it was a good idea to, particularly with the rarer species, be as conservative as you could with regulation. And I've en encouraged the uh, fishery service to be as tight as possible. Uh, the result is that a number of us got together and uh, effectively had whale watching on right whales banned in U.S. waters. Uh, the re it w wasn't banned. It was the uh, whale watching in any boat activity is supposed to be uh, 500 yards away, which is, if you even with a whale, is a pretty long way away to have much fun. Uh, I, I think that when we're dealing with endangered species, we should always... Uh, or on the side of conservative. Having said that, and, and so I think that, I think we're going to see increasing whale watching, uh, although it does seem to be reaching saturation. I think that the federal agencies, I can't speak for Stellwagen Bank, but I know that they are sensitive to the, both the, in, the value of the education uh, of aboard whale watching boats and to the concern for the animals. Uh, I personally think that we should see careful and active regulation. Having said that, the data uh, on humpback whales that are the most looked at of any group of whales, perhaps only gray whales in the, in the uh, bays of Baja are more looked at. The, the humpbacks here uh, show a remarkably high reproductive rate, which is at least one measure. They seem pretty happy. Uh, and if you look at whales that go over to boats, or some that do versus ones that don't, there's no indication that within any measure, course though they may be, that the whales are suffering. Still, we're in the habitat of a rare animal, and we ought to at least have the pretense of being cautious about it. And I imagine uh, that uh, the sanctuary in particular, who really has a lot to say on that point, we'll be looking at it. I'm, I'm staring at him, and he's looking somewhere else. But uh, he's not the man who makes the decision, but he's certainly one of those who says, here's where we ought to be looking. Uh, I hope there is a careful view on both respects. It is an important educational part of it. What, would right whales be as protected as they are, and, and would our concern be as high if it were not for whale watching? How about whaling? It can be argued that a lot of the power behind the anti-whaling constituency uh, has come from the experience being close to animals and perhaps improperly, but nonetheless thinking they're awfully intelligent and awfully much like my grandmother and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I don't ever dispel that to whale watchers because I think it serves a purpose, uh, yet it's a bit of a stretch. No, no, my grandmother, she w they are like, that's... <laughs> Yeah, Mason. Yeah. 
Yeah, the question is one that actually relates not only to the whale watching regulation issue, but also to fisheries, and that is that uh, the agencies that deal with this have an obligation to put on their on their uh, their panels and boards to make the decisions people who come from two different sides, and then they usually confront us with the argument that we then have to come to consensus. Uh, follow me. You've got people who have diametrically opposite views who are then asked to come to consensus. And, and Mason's question is, how do you break through that? Well, you can do it easily by simply impaneling people who have nothing to do with either. Of course, both will then argue, if, if their ox is gored, that uh, they're getting too much regulation and there was too much influence here or there. It's a difficult situation. Most uh, people, and I'm sure the, the sanctuary manager here will tell you that uh, you don't have a lot of choice within the federal government but to put on these boards people from the industries. And, and all in all, it makes a lot of sense. The result, however, is stalemate stalemate, stalemate, and that has been true of, of trying to come up with, with fisheries management approaches towards entanglement. I serve on, on, on the take reduction team, and, uh, and I am as frustrated as the fishermen are that we can't ever seem to get anywhere while whales keep get, getting tangled up. Less dramatically, but no less part of the story, is the same sort of uh, committee uh, that uh, looks at uh, at whale watch regulations. You're not going to get the industry to, to to strangle itself, and you're not going to get the conservationists, the, the 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 animal welfare people, to say, "Oh, fine, go on over and look at those whales." Everybody can agree we don't want to run them over, so we can get consensus there. But quite honestly, it's a no-brainer. Nobody gains from that one. But how do you do the other? You get together and do something that's probably illegal in the federal government, and that is impanel a group that doesn't include any of the industries, any of the, any of the interest groups. And the result is nobody's happy. You might get a regulation, but the results are going to be pretty painful. There, that's it. Thank you. Oh.